campaign. A rewards campaign is where you give your customer something valuable in exchange for them doing something valuable for you. The most frequent place you'll find a rewards campaign are in loyalty programs. For example, if you buy enough burritos, they'll give you a, a free soft drink. Or if you fly around the world five times, you get enough miles for a bag of chips. Uh, something along those lines. But rewards campaigns don't need to be stuck inside loyalty programs. Actually, reward campaigns, it turns out, are pretty flexible. We found out a lot about that when we were looking at what some of our needs were. So our goal was to increase paid subscriptions to Fire TV content. That means things like HBO, Showtime, Cinemax. We wanted people to renew their subscriptions inside Amazon. Or actually, based on what I learned from the last presenter, um, we really had a need to look good for management so that we would get promoted and given raises. And because that was our need, what we did was we figured that we could raise these KPIs, impress our management, and all do better professionally. So we worked really hard at figuring out how we could please our customers so they would buy these things at Amazon. Um, okay, maybe we don't need to break it down that far. But we did actually do a lot of that work because we had a lot of different levers that we could pull. Traditionally, what the business had done is they had put things on sale to get people to you know, buy more of these things. Then you go out and you advertise the sale, you do your digital advertising, your print advertising, your TV advertising, you make sure everything is omnichannel, you send people mail, they open the mail and they buy it or they don't. They open the mail or they don't, they read the ads or they don't. What we got with a rewards campaign, however, was a lot more flexible than putting something on sale. Rewards campaigns, it turns out, don't train users to wait for sales. How many people see like the mattress store's annual going out of business sale? We, we have a mattress store that has an, I'm not kidding you, annual going out of business sale. Uh, about year three, I started catching on. Um, the second thing is, they can be targeted very specifically. Rewards campaigns can be targeted at a group of customers as specific as you can define programmatically. That's a very, uh, very specific group of customers. Uh, third, rewards campaigns can be used for more than just selling stuff. For example, how important would it be for customers to engage with you by subscribing to your newsletter or reading a newsletter that they've subscribed to? Um, so we, we leveraged the value of these rewards campaigns. And we, we instituted our rewards campaign to go ahead and get these three KPIs um, farther up the board. And so once we decided that we were going to do this, well, we're Amazon. The first thing we did is, well, we built a service. Now, <laughs> if you're a company full of engineers, this makes a whole lot of sense. Actually, it, it makes a whole lot of sense anyway, because if we're going to scale a program like this to work really well for everyone, uh, having it available programmatically so that our marketing people can go in there and add rewards, subtract rewards, set the criteria for earning rewards, define, the, you know, define all of these variables, it really helps if we don't have to engage engineers at every step of the way. So we created a, uh, a dashboard, a tool that we could use to go ahead and create these rewards campaigns. Uh, you create the rewards campaigns by figuring out what you want to get done, figuring out what you're going to offer as a reward, who you're going to offer it to, under what conditions, uh, and then you kind of create the rewards campaign. So um, the most valuable thing that we did when we were creating this tool, we focused the efforts on the cost per action not the actual reward that we were going to give. I mean, for gosh sakes, we're Amazon. We have a few million products in our catalog that we could choose from to offer our customers as a reward, right? So it's really easy to get caught up in thinking, what do you want to give as a reward? Um, what if we give them a gizmo? Great, but what if they get the gizmo, they return it, use the money to buy a, um, a gadget? Well oh gosh, maybe we don't want to do that. Maybe we give them a gift card, 25 pound gift card. But what happens if they only spend 15 pounds? Oh, I don't know, what are we gonna do? 
I mean, seriously, what would you do? Would you go to their home with a club and say, spend the next 10 pounds or give me the money back? I mean, <laughs> that's not realistic. So when you think of it in terms of a cost per action, what you understand is that the reward that you're gonna give someone is based on the value of the action they take. Once they've taken the action and you've given them the reward, you've lost agency in that transaction. So whether they return it and buy something else with it, whether they spend $15 on a $20 gift card, that's irrelevant to you because the primary goal of having them take the customer action that you want has been accomplished. So we focused our, our efforts on making sure it made business sense, that the cost per action that we were rewarding made business sense. So here's how things worked. Um, we went ahead and we offered a $10 Amazon credit for new subscribers and for returning resubscribers. <laughs> okay, again, did I mention that we have an entire catalog of product to choose from, yet we chose a gift card? Okay, we reserve the right to wake up smarter in the morning, and we did. So this is, this is fail number one, and we'll talk about what we learned in a little bit. Um, the second thing is we notified eligible customers that there was a rewards program, and they could get these rewards if they open the mail and take one of the required actions. So uh, that worked out pretty well. We actually generated five times as many first-time subscribers with the offer that we did without the offer, and that worked out pretty well. We had two times as many subscribers uh, re, re, you know, resubscribe after they'd lapsed with the offer as opposed to without the offer. The kind of a cool thing is what we got on the email. In email, we got a two times better response rate. Two, you know, you, know, you add uh, an additional 100% of people who open the mail when we announce in the subject line that there was a rewards campaign offer for the offer inside the email. Um, management was pretty happy with those results. So, so we're feeling good, right? So we're, we're getting the recognition, we're getting promotions, we're getting raises, and we got more work. Because they said if it works for the App Store, it should work around the rest of the company. So we did that. We, we um, actually changed the service so that it was consumable by groups outside of our own group. And other teams at Amazon started generating rewards campaigns. They were smarter than we were. They chose actual products from the Amazon store. Home. And we'll cover why that's really smart later. Um, but they also got really good results. And we got good results. They got good results. Management came up with this epiphany. Management said, my gosh, if it works for Amazon, we'll bet it works everywhere. <laughs> okay, remember when I said we reserve the right to wake up smarter tomorrow? Okay, it doesn't actually work everywhere. But this is part of what we learned, and that's, uh, that's part three. Um, what we did do, though, to test this hypothesis was we cherry-picked some partners that we wanted to work with. The partners that we chose were special because they understood the actions in their digital marketing that were valuable to them. Think about that. When a user signs up for your email list, how much is that worth to you? Do you know? When a user buys something from you, how likely are they to buy something else from you? And within how soon are they likely to buy something else from you? Do you know? If you know these things, then you can put a pretty good, pretty accurate price tag on how much it's worth to you to get customers to take those actions. And when you know how much it's worth to you, you can set a cost per action, and you can decide the value of the thing that you want to reward for the action. So we picked businesses that knew this. Uh, we figured it would be a pretty lousy you know, proof case to pick businesses that didn't know that, because um, they probably wouldn't be too happy. So we picked businesses that knew the, knew the answers to those questions, and their results actually turned out pretty good, too. So we were pretty happy with how, how all of this worked out, and those are some pretty impressive numbers. I mean, those numbers look great when you report them up to management in a weekly report, right? But I want to share with you some of the data 
some of the learning behind the numbers. So uh, let's look at an increase in first-time buyers. Typically for this customer, they would get about 2% of their customers who would come in and make a purchase. So when all of a sudden they got a little over 4% of their users coming in and making a purchase, that was fantastic. When you look at the revenue they earned from that, they doubled the revenue. I mean, that was really, you know, that was great. Unfortunately, when they were thinking about these campaigns, they were thinking not of going from 2% to 4%. They were thinking about going from 2% to like 70% or 80%. Not realistic. Uh, rewards campaigns can be really effective. Rarely do they actually create miracles. So when you're thinking about the kind of increase you want, uh, again, think about in proportion to what realistic ex expectations are. And that kind of tones down some of these numbers that you're seeing here is when you put them in realistic context of the actual result and numbers that you're getting. So further behind the numbers are a couple of things we learned about prize selection and actual real good um, goods and, and digital goods. Now, digital goods are amazing. For example, with um, uh, the game that we looked at, they had in-app purchases. Uh, you guys have all played a game like Candy Crush, right? You can go ahead and you can buy a, a bunch of power-ups for 99 cents or a bunch of other in-app purchase items. The cost of goods sold for those items is zero. They're created and assigned to you digitally. Zero cost of goods sold. That is amazing for rewards campaigns. Why, you can go ahead and say, listen, for any $50 in-app purchase, we're gonna give away a $24 speaker because you know we'll still make 26 bucks each and every time we sell something. That's an amazing setup, uh, so why not? And as a matter of fact, if we have a bunch of people who have been spending $50 and we want them to spend 100, I'll tell you what, the first time you spend $100, we'll give you a $24 speaker. Why? Because we're still making money on the back end on every single one. So if you have the ability, if you're in the kind of a business where you have a zero cost of goods sold item, I can't tell you how awesome reward campaigns are and how broadly you want to communicate that. Um, additionally, uh, one of the other magic things we found was the power of the physical object. Having something, um, oh, let's see, where are we here? Uh, yeah, so the, there's a halo effect around rewards campaigns. The effect lasted, on, in our experience, about 30 days after the campaign ended. So if you're looking for people who are engaging with one of your tools, the engagement lasted 30 days after the campaign ended. And we were kind of wondering about why that was the case. I mean, in most of the cases, when an ad is over, um, desirable behavior stops pretty close to the end of the ad, uh, except with rewards campaigns. And one of the things we discovered is that physical items generate a ton of excitement and are very memorable. There's relatively little marketing out there that will deliver a box with a big smile on your doorstep. And well, you know, in my household, coming home to an Amazon box on the doorstep is kind of commonplace now. I mean, I still get excited when I see the box there, right? And your customers are going to get really excited when they see a box on their doorstep that you guys provided for them. They're going to open it up and they're going to go, oh, hey, it's a stuffed animal I got for signing up for the wildlife newsletter. This is really cool. And that turns into word of mouth, it turns into increased affinity and increased recognition, and all kinds of really good halo effects result out of making a delightful moment of that interaction with your business and your company. And that moment is something that is really sticky. Uh, check out um, Dan and Chip Heath's book, uh, The Power of Moments, uh, for a deeper dive on why you want to engineer delightful moments into your marketing. Getting a smiling package on your doorstep is a delightful moment. And uh, on the, also on, on, on this case, as powerful as reward campaigns are in generating these delightful moments, 
if the action that you're rewarding stinks, your results are going to stink too. And if you've got an action where you've got someone signing up for a newsletter that's uncompelling and has no call to action, don't expect magical results because they got to your newsletter from a rewards campaign. Back to realistic expectations. So remember that rewards deliver great results and uh, they don't create miracles. So now if we had it to do again, what would we change or what would we do? Well, the first thing is we would actually tone down a little bit of our own excitement here. Rewards campaigns don't work everywhere. Um, but they do work almost everywhere. So I'm not going to read the list on the left to you. You guys can read the, the list, you know, banks, airlines, restaurants, things like that. What's interesting is where they don't work. Where rewards campaigns don't work is when there is a single upfront payment for a non-recurring transaction. I know a lot of you are thinking, that's a terrible business model, one upfront payment for a non-recurring transaction. Who's in that kind of business? Actually, our previous speaker talked about one of those businesses. When, when you sell a bride a wedding dress, do you put her in a tickler file, send her mail six months later saying, hey, that guy was a loser. Seriously, buy another dress from me. I'll give you half off. I mean, no, you don't do that. A wedding dress is one of these single upfront payments where you don't expect a lot of repeat business if, if everything goes well. Um, similarly, compulsory spend is a terrible place for a rewards program. Your reward for paying your taxes, not going to prison. Okay, they got that one built in. Uh, also, um, required textbooks at school. You know what? Nobody in the school bookstore cares if you read the textbook or not. They're not going to say, hey, if you read the first hundred pages within the first week, we'll send you another discount on, on future textbooks. They don't care. It's compulsory. They've got your business whether you want to give it to them or not. So in those cases, really sales are more effective at generating immediate uh, conversion of, of prospects to customers. Next is what behavior to reward. And this is really cool because for, for the most part, people usually think about one-time transactions like, you know, buying a wedding dress or uh, signing up for a newsletter, maybe, you know, making a restaurant reservation online, uh, which is cool because it takes pressure off of your staff to answer the phone and stuff. But rewards campaigns can also be used to generate and build customer habits. And this is super important. For example, um, it, I don't see the rep from KLM here. Is she here? KLM? Shoot, no, she left. OK, because uh, this is really relevant. When you lose your bag, when the airline loses your bag, uh, when you're traveling, problems ensue. Uh, the first thing you do is you get on your phone, you call the airline, you say, my bag is missing. It turns out they don't know any more than you do. You've had to go through this horribly painful phone tree to get no information. They've had to spend money on an agent who can't tell you anything. It just is really bad all the way around. You're miserable, they've lost money, but you can make this better. Several airlines, KLM included, have a Track My Bag app now. And if you check the status of your bag on that app on the mobile device, it'll tell you where, your last, where the bag was last in your travels. You'll find out what airport it's in, you'll be able to enter the address of where you want it delivered, and you'll get updates on how far away your bag is, all before you would ever be able to get through the phone tree if you called. Here's the problem. Most passengers don't know this when their bag shows up missing. And so they're pissed, they're panicking, all of their underwear is in that bag, so they go and do the normal thing, they phone. But what if you could do this? What if as an airline you could say, I want you to check your bag status, even if it's not lost, on each of your next three flights? If you do that, we'll send you a really cool luggage tag as a reward. Oh, sure, I could use a really cool luggage tag, and it gives me an excuse to try this luggage thing. So you do the luggage thing three times, you get your, your luggage tag, 
you know, six months later, your bag is misplaced. You don't pick up your phone and call anyone. Now you pick up your phone, you remember the baggage app, you find out where your bag is, you're happier a lot faster, they save money by not answering the phone tree, and the only thing it cost them was a stupid luggage tag. That's brilliant. That's building a customer habit that's going to save you a ton of money down the road. And that's a perfect use of a rewards campaign that most people, um, except a few airlines, um, just have really never thought of. So go ahead and make sure you can consider uh, rewards programs for building good behaviors. Now, uh, the economics of rewards programs. These are actually different. Rewards that pay for themselves immediately are like the zero cost of goods sold example. When you have something like that, you don't care who finds out about the reward because you make money each and every time. You want to tell as many people as frequently as possible, and that's a good thing. Some actions, however, pay for themselves in aggregate or on average. For example, if you run a wildlife federation, and you know that people who read your newsletter donate $100 more on average than people who don't, it might be worth $15 to send them a stuffed panda bear for reading the newsletter. Now, the first person you send that panda bear to may not donate $100 more. But over you know, a large enough sample, on average, you're getting $100 more because you've given out this $15 stuffed teddy bear, stuffed um, uh, panda bear. So uh, those, are, those are things that you need to recognize that you're going to need a critical mass for. If you don't yet have a critical mass of customers that you can include in the cohort to which you offer the reward, really rethink about whether you're going to do it or not because you know, at a relatively small volume, that you may not hit that point, that law of, of returns yet. Similarly, with these programs, you really don't want absolutely everyone to find out about it. I guarantee there's a dad somewhere who's too cheap to go out and buy his daughter a regular stuffed animal for her birthday. And he sees, wait a minute, I just sign up for a newsletter and I get a free panda bear? Great, I'll throw it to junk mail and I'll get the panda bear. What you want to do is you want to use the tools that you've already got to make sure that someone has read or at least opened three of the emails. Once you've seen that they've opened the third one, send them the panda bear. Lazy dads aren't going to wait around for three monthly newsletters to show up, but the committed diehard environmentalist or wildlife conservationist will. And even if they open those three mails, then it's on your job, you know, your job to make sure that they read them. But your marketing team has now gotten them to open the mails so that they get that cute little panda bear. Um, so think about that for reward economics. Um, we just talked a little bit how to announce awards for if you do this, get that. It depends a lot on the economic slide previously. But you can also create delightful surprises. Uh, this is particularly useful when your customer is going through a very high friction transaction. Uh, mortgage, online mortgage application is my favorite example. Has anyone ever actually tried to fill out an online loan application or online mortgage application? No hands, you're all smarter than I am. It's a colossal pain. Um, normally, halfway through the process, it's going to ask for you to manually type in a whole bunch of documents that you don't happen to have right next to your computer. You're going to have to go rummage through doors, drawers in the den to find it. And it's really easy just to say, save my process, I'll come back and deal with it later. Not everybody comes back to finish later. Actually, not as many people as you think come back to finish it later. Banks have a really strong incentive to make sure that when you start that loan application, you finish the loan application. So banks also know where the high drop-off point is in those applications. So right before the customer gets to those drop-off points, what they can say is, hey, we know that this is a long process. We know that you're asking, we're asking you to do a lot of work. And when you finish the loan application, we'd like to give you a free financial calculator as our way of saying thanks for sticking through the application. Dang, I had already agreed to get the loan. They don't have to give me a calculator. Wow, I was going to do this anyway. That was really nice of them. Geez, I'm doing business with a really great company. And now they want me to go and dig through my drawers and pull out this stuff. 
Oh, heck, yeah, they're great guys. Let me go, let me get that stuff. Let me type it in, and I'll finish alone. I'll get the calculator. God, what nice guys I'm working with. That incentive to go ahead and finish the application in that sitting um, is phenomenal for banks, and it's actually a really, really valuable thing to do, and is more effective than actually offering a quarter point off of the origination fees for loans. So think about that when you have a high friction process that you really need to move customers through in any part of your customer pipeline. Uh, next, uh, reward selection. What kind of reward do you pick? I mean, do you have to pick really expensive stuff? Do you have to pick really cheap stuff? Well, <laughs> we did that wrong. Um, <laughs> we had, we had a, uh, an experiment where we wanted people to play um, uh, a game and get to a certain level. And we offered them a $49 prize for doing it. Guess what? Almost everyone did it. We offered them a $25 prize. Almost everyone did it. We offered them a $15 prize. Almost everyone did it. Um, $5 prize. Almost everyone. $2 prize. Pretty much no one. Okay, so there's a really steep curve there between $2 and $5, but it's way short of the huge amount that we thought it was. So you can actually get away for actions that are relatively easy and quick to accomplish, you can get away with a fairly low value reward. Remember, they're there in the first place because they want to be. You're offering them extra incentive to kind of increase that completion percentage where you might have some friction or you may have a particularly valuable customer action you want them to take. The only place you need to spend a lot of money on a reward is where you have uh, a lot of personal information you're asking for or it's a rather long and involved process. Those are places where you actually want to step up and spend a little bit more money. And again, you want to spend money on some physical item that gets delivered to them because that gets you the halo effect. That gets you all the really good benefits about that delightful moment. Uh, don't do what we did, chicken out and just give away a gift card. Um, that's, you guys can do better than that. Uh, cohort selection, who do you offer it to? For rewards that pay for themselves, Everyone, offer them to the world. For easier or immediate rewards, uh, you can give them to pre-existing customers or customers who take a certain number of actions. Again, we're trying to shortcut the cheap dad scenario here. Um, delightful surprises, you sneak those up on them and you pick cohorts who are particularly valuable for your business. Uh, Long-term customers, customers who have spent a lot of money with you, customers that are really very high in their probability count or probability metric. You can give those people delightful surprises and not have to spend any marketing money at all on people who are relatively low probability. Because remember, using smart, definable cohorts, you can target exactly who you want to spend your marketing money on, the people most likely to convert and drive revenue. So, things that matter uh, about rewards, uh, they're flexible. You can build habits, you can create uh, one-time transactions. They are uh, really good at retaining customers. You can drive completion of high abandoned tasks and uh, you know, provide benefits for customers who behave well, which is really important when you have customers that you need to go through a specific role of tasks. The cohort that you target can help save you a ton of money in kind of blanketing a whole bunch of, of ad marketing all over a bunch of different sources because you can get very specific in who you target and, and really smart about the conditions under which you reward uh, the prizes. So um, that's a, it's a really good alternative to putting things on sale because it's so much powerful than just selling something and it's so much more flexible than having to blast an ad out there or, or, or blasting a sale out there to just about everyone. Now, I understand that I am the last speaker of the day, so we're just gonna go ahead and cut straight to my reading list. About these two books, uh, The Power of Moments, mentioned that one earlier. Read this and design delightful moments into your marketing. Super important to do that. Uh, the other book, also by Dan and Chip Heath, is called Switch. This is more valuable than the last two graduate students I hired, the last two MBAs I hired. 
I would rather hire people who have read and put this book into action than hire someone else from Kellogg or Berkeley's business school. I think that highly of this book. Um, it'll change how you market. Guys, thank you very much for your time. Uh, hopefully I have time for one or two questions. And then y'all are free to leave or drink. Like, where are the drinks? I can answer that one. It's different to yesterday. How do I get to the airport? I can answer that one, too. <laughs> yeah. OK, guys, thank you very much for coming to the talk, for coming to Digimark on London. I really hope I get to see you guys back here next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>